There we go. An old guy, Australia, coming to you live from uh, Dalmini, believe it or not. Uh, like and share, subscribe on YouTube and Instagram. Now, I've got the beautiful Marie Francis with me. And Marie is an amazing lady who I've, I've never met in person. Uh, correct, Marie? No. No, correct. But we will one day. Correct. I absolutely <laughs> guarantee that. We'll, we'll, we'll definitely meet one day. I, in fact, uh, yes, I'd like to have a bit of a get-together like in various states. Yeah. You know? And then invite the people I know in that state and say, "Look, I'm going to be at uh, such and such place. Go on down." Anyway, I yeah, don't. Except know. I want to, I want to come to your part of the world, so I'm probably going to meet you there. Hey, <laughs> doors always open. That's my favourite place. The door is always open, Marie. Always open. All you do is let us know when you're coming, and we'll leave. No, it's not true. <laughs> <laughs> now, Marie, Marie Francis, the woman with two first names. I love it. <laughs> You, now, I, first of all, before we get in, in, into this any further, I just need to say that um, when I spoke to you, and I actually spoke to you just a little while ago prior to recording this, one of the things that I said to you was your life mirrored the life that I was trying to create, but never did. And you actually went and did it. <clears throat> and um, I'm going to let people know what that is because it's a fascinating story. I think that's what actually got me going. It's really unusual, but there you go. Now, Marie Francis is the beautiful daughter of some Italian immigrants who came to Australia in 1964, you said, I think it was. Now, it, were they what they used to call 10-pound poms, but that was English. But, uh, but still, we took in a lot of refugees and immigrants from other Australia, uh, not refugees, a lot of immigrants from other countries in the 50s and 60s after the war to boost our stocks here in Australia. And at that stage, we took a lot of people who had uh, cultural similarities and um, religious similarities, et cetera, et cetera. But I think I might have heard you say 64 and 66. So did your dad come out first, did he? Uh, it, yeah, he did. So a uh, long chain of um, my, my uncle, my mum's brother came out, and then he called my mum's sister out. There was another sister at some point. Mm -hmm. Then my mum, uh, so my so my mum's sister is married to my dad's brother. So my dad's yeah. brother, um, actually, no, my mum's sister called my mum out and my grandfather, and then my mum called my dad out because they were already engaged. Oh, okay. So, yeah, and I got married here. In Australia. And then yeah. you've lived in Melbourne pretty much all your life. I pretty fact. much was born about 10 minute, not even drive from here. The local oh, shop you live. Live. was a street. <laughs> Palmerston, oh no, it wasn't Palmerston Grove, I forget the name, but I was born in uh, Oakley, which is the next suburb up from where I live. And well, I've the good part about that is that um, that uh, having seen a lot of your photos, you do do a lot of travelling and that's fine. Other than that, yeah. we think, well, you never lived in bloody Melbourne. So. Yeah, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm a very local girl. <laughs> very much a local girl. A local, now, have, on, that, on that subject, just bringing it up briefly, when you went, whereabouts you did, you attended school down there. How did you fit in with the local people? Was, was there, did you have any kind of major bullying or was there, well, you obviously yeah. don't have an accent, but you certainly have that ethnic look and that's fine. But did yeah. you, did you find that there was any kind of real discrimination back in your day? I, yeah, I did. I, um, I started at a uh, fairly large government school. So I did grade prep and one, um, mm -hmm. at that school. And, um, I hated it. <laughs> so um, it was it actually just recently realised that I had abandonment issues because I was, I'm an only child. So having been left at school for the first time, never been to kinder or anything like that, in a school of, geez, I don't know, 600 kids, well, I was yeah. like, whoa, <laughs> you know, and uh, have had stories told me of where my dad would have to leave work and come pick me up from school. Oh, no. um, yeah, yeah. So uh, there was a more local Catholic school just up the street um, yep. that, I don't know, somehow, I, don't know, I must have been meant to go there. I don't know. It was much smaller. There was only one class of each uh, year level um, as okay. big as they were, about 35 kids mm. in each at the time. And I did find that I was bullied for being ethnic. Um, oh, really? Yeah, yeah. That old until, uh, until they saw the food you had to eat and they went, oh, well, 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 well
Yeah, quite interesting because, <laughs> you know, they'll pay 18 bucks for a brisketter now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> but everything else is just tomato on bread. Yeah. Well, so, see, the laugh last. The laugh laugh was on you. <laughs> You know, yeah. everybody so, has gold me over their cabin. Anyway, so I've got, I've got it. Oh, hang on. I've lost my video there. Won't <laughs> Not that it matters. Um, I have a lot of Italian, uh, ethnic friends, particularly in the Italian um, quarter. What's going on here? You there keep you getting excited. <laughs> yeah, oh, now I've gone from a different view. Check that out. That's probably better, actually. Well, yeah. that's, no, I've had numerous re- uh, requests about this poster behind me, Mars Attacks. And yes, it is an original poster. Oh, yeah, it's a cult movie, cult classic. It doesn't <laughs> it's only there to block my head. Um, <laughs> so, so what did your dad and mum work at down in Victoria? So um, I'm, interestingly, my mum and my aunt, her next yeah. oldest sister, worked at an elastics factory eventually for a lot of years. So it, okay. it was called elastics, but they made mm-hmm. shoelaces, elastics and stuff, uh, yeah. uh, pretty much textiles. Um, okay. Until you know, kind of uh, probably the 90s. Uh, I can't remember exactly when, you know, manufacturing went to shit in yep. this country and they started to import it. And so all they did was bag it up, bring it in from China or wherever and bag it up in new bags, put new labels on it and send it back yeah. out. So um, my dad, um, yeah, they had a, a number of different. My mum started in an onion factory when she first got here. Really? <laughs> And she, I always, she's passed away now, but I always remember her um, whenever she, and I'm the same, can't cut onions, always really? crying. And I'm she just, like, yeah, can't do this anymore. So then she went, uh, worked at the Cadbury factory um, mm-hmm. down in Abbotsford, yeah. Collingwood. Um, oh, yeah, because anyway, they shut and, that down. Yeah. Yeah. And then, then she ended up um, where my aunt was working. My dad, on the other hand, uh, he had a bunch of different jobs, but he eventually mm. landed one with a company called Ingersoll Rand. And yeah, I know them. Yeah, they, they, yeah, yeah, and, awesome. yeah, yeah. So he was making um, heavy road machinery. Yeah, yep. they were, you know, mm. like they weren't production. They were, but they were like, you know, had an order for like five big machines, so they just make mm. those, and then yep. they get the next order in. And he was there mm. for over twenty five years. So well, there you go. Yeah. Is he still around yeah. or? Yeah, my dad is. Yeah, is he's he? Okay. Yeah. So, Good on him. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. Um, and and I'm going to I'll stereotype here and say that he more than likely grows all his own fruit, uh, vegetables. In yeah, the, he like does. The we are yeah. so lucky, actually. <laughs> we have <laughs> all my Italian yeah. friends. They all got <laughs> jars of bloody uh, what is it, passata and. <laughs> yeah, like, we oh. um we have oranges. Yeah, uh, oranges, yeah. Onions, cherries, pears. He even grows bananas. I don't even know how he does it in Melbourne. In Melbourne. There you go. Yeah, he's got a green thumb. I haven't got a clue either. <laughs> now, <laughs> I've got to tell people, you're actually an architect, a registered architect, correct? I now, am. you started off very similar to me. Oh, hang on a second. I do apologise. I'll have to just uh, turn this off. I do apologise. I didn't think to do that before. Um. Oh, hang on, don't know how to do this. It'll stop in a second. The phone. I just realised what it is. <laughs> yeah, big cams ringing me. Um, you started off doing tech drawing, and then you went to. You became one of only two people in Australia using AutoCAD. For those who don't, well, no, not, uh, no not in Australia. In the office. <laughs> in the office. Okay. The office. Apologize. Yeah. So that yeah. really took over from uh, in architecture, uh, in particularly in tech drawing and architectural design. AutoCAD was a big thing that came out, I think, in the eighties, and that um, that revolutionised um, uh, architectural drawing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah? yeah. So that really, basically, for those who don't know, all that really is is a computer program outlining, you know, doing, and you can do, all do also do estimates. Correct? You can do like all sorts of estimates using the ah, uh, there would yeah, there would be add on add on programs yeah. and stuff like that, but yeah, it yeah. is very much many, like. How much electrical, how much concrete, how much timber, how much... You know, yeah, look, we still send that off to our estimators. <laughs> Do you really? Okay. Uh, there, there is a new program called Revit, which is kind of the next thing, which is also 3D. So you draw, oh. um, yeah, as you draw the wall, you tell it it's a wall and it's a window and you give it sizes and it builds a 3D model as you're drawing. Um, I'm about yeah, that sounds to like great that. fun. Yeah, I'm about to learn that even though... Oh, okay. I feel a bit old. <laughs> <laughs> like a dinosaur, but 
but I have just bought that program, so we'll see how it goes. But Whoa. Uh, okay. yeah, AutoCAD was literally you just you still got to draw the line. The only good thing yep. was that if you didn't have to scratch out, you know, with the old drafting no. paper. Oh, the yeah. Razor blade. yeah, that was yeah. the worst sound first thing oh, on a Monday man. morning. I remember doing my um my tech drawing. It was as I was mentioned to you before, and we didn't know if we'd made any mistakes until we sent it away. There's only four of us in New South Wales were doing um tech drawing. I was doing it here at Naruma, and our manual arts teacher, um, God rest his soul, Mr. Sparks, had no idea. He couldn't help us at all. He 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 would scratch his head and walk away and go, oh, "I'm going to clue." And so we would have to try to figure out uh, what they were saying and then draw it, of course, et cetera, et cetera, and then send it off, and it'd come back with. You know, red marks all over it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, uh, architecture is, it's not like drafting. They don't actually teach you to draw. So they, they teach you yeah. to design and then they throw you to the wolves. Ooh, and then the yeah. first three or four years, you're like, I don't know how to draw. I better get with the program very quickly. Well, I always think of it as yeah. um, like you be a baker, a baker and then you become a pastry cook or something. I don't know. It's like a, yeah. another step up. So as far as I'm concerned, you're up there now. Well, I might as well throw this at you. What have you designed? Any major buildings we may know of? Uh, oh, there's one. That's not, a cool one. Ma- no, no, not not major ones. Uh, I have designed, like I've been working for a uh, 94 to, holy shit, 28 years. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I sometimes drive past buildings that I've worked on and that I'd totally forgotten yep. that I'd All designed. Right. Yeah, yeah, so I've done... Um, I've done some major work. So I started off doing warehouses and offices. Mm-hmm. So I worked on the southeast water building that's down in Moorabbin in in Melbourne. Yep. Um, that was a that was a long time ago. Um, but I, I've done these mega 20, 25,000 um, metre squared warehouses for companies like Salter uh, Properties that do all the freight, you know, um, yep. distribution. They call it. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. Yeah, I used to do a lot of petrol stations. <laughs> I ended up I did so many <laughs> jokes, did my eyes shut. <laughs> oh no. Got a, little, got a little boring. But um my my passion is residential stuff. And at the moment I'm I'm getting into the apartment kind of so, so we're talking low level kind of, you know, three, four story high apartments. Yep. Um because I find it just gives you a lot of, you know, creative opportunities. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also with apartments, they're a bit of a challenge because you actually physically have to make them work as a building because they're not just lines okay. on paper. Mm-hmm. So I have this ability to, when I draw a line, I know it's not a line, I know I'm drawing, it's a bit of timber and it's got to connect mm-hmm. with something else. So um, I discovered this passion when I was in grade two, to be honest. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I was in grade two when our teacher asked us to do this it must have been, she must have been at uni or something and doing a master's. So she, she asked us mm-hmm. to do this, like it was a cognitive kind of exercise to see how kids mm-hmm. perceive the world around them. And she asked all of yeah. us to draw our house plan. And I remember drawing oh, mine no, and going, yeah, yeah, yeah. it looks yeah. like a duck, that's wrong. Oh. And from that moment, <laughs> I remember having this interest in what actually does a plan look like. I used to walk around with like brown paper bags drawing plans when I was little. Really weird. No, you <laughs> but, were, um, no not really. Yeah. So you're destined to become this. Now, I'm only going to touch on this lightly because it's just something you and I have spoken to about off air, but your son, because you're an only child, yeah. and then your son's an only child, yeah. right? And he could be, who knows, the next <laughs> big thing in Australian cricket. Am oh. I right or am I right? <laughs> he's off I don't the, know. He's off the cricket he, academy, true? Uh, no, so, no, he's just uh, training with Melbourne Cricket Club at the moment. Whoa. So, so he's he's gone up a level from yeah community cricket to district cricket. And how old um, is he now? He's nineteen. Yeah, Ooh, he's nineteen. First name? So, uh, James. First name? James Jimmy. Francis. We'll keep a little eye out for James Francis. <laughs> Currently training with the Melbourne Cricket Club. Hey, stop, yeah, it's not that. Stop Australia. <laughs> <laughs> he'd he loved, he loved to play dream big Victoria. Kid. Dream yeah. big kid. Buy your mother a bloody winery in South France and we'll be happy. Okay. A bit of contract with that with Australia. <laughs> now, <clears throat> now, you, how did you fare during the, because uh, you're living in Melbourne, in Victoria, and uh, mm. we won't go into it in great detail. Suffice no. to say, the world knows that uh, Victoria suffered probably some of the most archaic and horrendous 
uh, legislation that has ever been passed in pretty much the history of mankind. And to this day, it still has a rippling effect down there. Although Dan's doing his best to get reelected, so he's, you know, promising the world. Um, how did you find coping with it down in Victoria? Because a lot of people are watching from overseas or from out of state, and yeah. they may not have had that kind of uh, view of what Victoria was really like under Dan. Yeah, look, uh, it was an interesting few months, but, uh, particularly oh, the first the first big lockdown that we had because mm -hmm. I can't even remember if we had any small ones before it or not because there were that many mm -hmm. of them. Um, but I, the thing for me was at one point we weren't allowed to go further than five kilometres from our homes. Mm -hmm. You go for a walk down the street and there'd be cops at the end of the park. Make, so, you know, if there was a coffee shop, so, you know, we, we're going out, support local. We go and buy a coffee from the local coffee shop to keep them going. Yeah. And then we want to go sit on the grass in the park just for five minutes to drink it. And there's cops at the end of the street making sure people are moving on. It's wow. just, yeah, it was out of control. Um, the other stuff was, I yeah, don't want to talk about, you know, what the mandates were all about, but that was quite no, interesting. The, the issue I wanted to address with you, because, and I say this because you are of Italian descent, and we understand with a lot of ethnic people, they have a huge family units. And I know that's how up in here in New South Wales, they went and attacked South East Sydney because that's where most of the uh, mm. Islamic community resided and they had to break that apart. But I don't want to get into that yeah. as well. However, I would assume that having large family units and like your mum and dad and relatives, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. those kind of things would have put enormous pressure on, on your actual family unit. Yeah, they did. They did. So. Um... In fact, one uncle, I uh, just saw him again today for the first time in oh, wow. a long time, over a year. And wow. okay. typically we would see him, you know, once every one or two months, maybe. Yep. So the whole thing, you know, we all know that there was a lot of fear and, and mm -hmm. I get it. So I don't actually, uh, I'm a, probably a bit unlike you, I don't actually have a problem with people that went off and got vaccinated because it's yep. their choice, their journey. Uh, but yep. I did have a lot of um, your brainwashing, uh, mm -hmm. you know, your family for not getting vaccinated. And and some of yep. this was actually coming from really good friends who I know um, were really concerned about me and my dad's health and, you know, and my uncle who's also elderly and is always with us and my yep. aunt, how she passed away too now. And I know it was coming from that, but there was this whole feeling of why do they feel like they have to tell me what to do? And and I yes. felt like I didn't have a voice, to be honest. And yep. if I look back, I actually never had a voice. <laughs> Being a female no. in an Italian family, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah. in my life I felt like I haven't had a voice. So, and it, it kind of, I don't know, it, that whole situation got me in this thing where I was like, like I I have got a voice and, and I'm actually... I may or may not use it. I'll decide when to use it, but I am actually going to take this stand. And I knew beforehand what I was going to lose. You know, like I said mm -hmm. to the boys, and we were all, I didn't have to convince anyone in my family. Yep. We're all yeah, the same that's okay. Now. We won't mention yeah. it. But yeah. We won't use yeah. the term. No. Or you but, but, might decide to kick me off yeah. again. <laughs> But I, I said to the boys, you know, the most you'll miss out on is a season of footy or whatever because it can't yeah. go on forever. And so, yeah. you know, we just proceed in that way. But, yeah, there there is a divide in our in our larger family that, that Absolutely. you know. And what about have friends, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, I know personally um, not being able to go visit people, not being able to have those communication with people. And, and I'm very much a tactile person. So even my mates, I, I hug them. They might get a bit thingy about it, but that's okay. I'm not, you know, grabbing them by the leg. And I'm, yeah. I, I like to, I like to, you know, I like yeah. contact that we all do and we all need that kind of thing. And I think that was one of the big issues with these uh, closures that uh, yeah. kept us all away from each other. And then we had this where we no longer had that kind of contact. And, and so there was every effort made to stop us being, you know, in contact with each other. Yeah. And that's what really bothered me immensely. So, I'm going to ask you, Marie Francis, because, uh, and I'm going to run us right through to our end of time now. I've written to you and I've asked you how you view the term hope and what kind of message you might have for people who find themselves 
you know, maybe struggling a little or um, mm. coming to terms, struggling to come to terms with uh, how the last two or three years have evolved and, um, and find themselves, you know, getting a little isolated or left alone and, and, mm. and not sure how they're going to cope. What kind of message of hope would you have for them? Yeah, so, you know, I thought about this. And I know I yes, I know. Yeah. Definitely and I too. thought to myself, you know, how do, how do you give people hope? And, uh, you know, I decided the only way to do that is to be the hope. So basically, Ooh, nice. yeah, so basically I live my life in, in a positive way, as you mm -hmm. know. <laughs> I do, yes, and, well, um, I certainly do. It's important for people to understand, I think, that we're never alone, you know. No. Um, everyone's going through something. You know, if you look at, at Facebook and all the social mm -hmm. media, it looks like people are posting, going, oh, you know, like it's my anniversary, such a beautiful mm -hmm. relationship. But yeah. what you don't know yeah. is that behind the scenes, it's actually not yes. like that at all, you know. And so everyone has been affected by, you know, what we've just been through. Um, mm -hmm. in in some way or other. And so the important thing to remember is that no one's actually ever alone. And, no. you know, um, someone who's thinking, you know, what, what of the future? Well, you, the way I look at it, um, I kind of, I try, <laughs> I'm going to call it manifesting. <laughs> so that'll do. That'll do. I'll call it manifesting. So, so because I'm a true believer that everything that's happening to me right now is a manifestation of everything I've thought and said and done nice. from yep. all my life to now. Yep. So I, we're all experienced at manifesting the good, bad and ugly, right? So mm -hmm. if we know we can manifest the good, then why wouldn't we focus on what the future, what we want the future to look like? And because our thoughts are quite powerful and our yes. words. Yeah. So we just, you know, I, I often so I do a bit of coaching <laughs> Mm -hmm. I won't get into that, but I often say to clients, or we often say as a group of coaches to clients, um, you know, get clear on what you want. What do you want your future to look like? Focus on that. And I know in my own life that, you know, when, when we were going through the, the lockdowns and stuff like that, you know, the concern was, will James be able to play um, cricket or footy or go to uni, you know, without having yeah. to have, have the, you know, what. and. Yeah, that. So I would just focus on, well, it's all going to be fine. Yeah, don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. And I just kept a positive outlook. And then one day they get home and they go, guess what? He's allowed to play cricket. And then another day they come home, guess what? He's allowed to go on campus at uni. And, it, you know, so it's it's easier than you think. you just got to believe that you can control your future in that way just by, it's like you decide to go on a holiday. Once you make that decision, all your actions and thoughts you know, follow through for it to happen. Yeah. So it's the yeah, same yeah. same thing. You think about, okay, what do I want my future to look like? I wanna mm -hmm. I don't know, I wanna live by the beach or whatever. And then you start working towards it. Um I I I, I, I hear what you're saying. And uh and I, I'm in agreement with it because I, I I think um one of the things that struggled that I struggle with is um is people who uh, profess a faith like Christianity, for argument's sake, and um, and part of that teaching is the manifestation of the spoken word. So you know, and uh, yet they learn this, but putting it into practice, they find is a much greater difficulty. And and that, and I I, I sort of go, I kind of go, and, and and that's why I think a lot of people who had that profession of faith um, went to the dark side. You know, they, out of fear, they gave into that fear and went, no, I've got, I'm going to have to go and do this. I'm going to have to go and do this. And they went to the dark side. And I'm like, whoa, if there's anybody that should never have gone there, it's you. If there's anybody who I wouldn't think would go there, it's you. And yeah. look where you are. You know, I, I don't yeah. get it. And now they're going, oh my God, what have we yeah. done? And I'm like, but, okay, but so this is a profession of faith. Yeah. But I mean, that's the thing. It's all about having faith, isn't it? Yeah. So not well, just in a, in a God or whatever. Faith can't exist together, you know. Yeah, It's like correct. oil and water, you know. Exactly. That's right. And fear's so, the biggest factor running through, rampant through our society today and through most people. Um, yeah. People are just afraid. And even now that things have calmed down and people are far more um, amicable and, and more approachable, um, 
that's still, I always reminds me of just a, you know, you've, you've made a nice bowl and it's on the stove and you've got it on really low heat and it's just sitting there simmering away, simmering, simmering away. It's like them. Because uh, the moment the government yeah. says something, they're going to be oh, 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 freaking out again, you know, because it's just yeah. all there ready to go, you know. So, you know, anyway. So, look, I appreciate your time and I know you're a very busy woman. <laughs> you're right. But you are. You are. It's just an an excuse not to work. <laughs> Anyone oh, who knows damn. me will know that's true. Well, you can <laughs> just do some man. You can stay back and do work after. Look, I appreciate your time, and I and I love the fact that you were willing to come and talk to me because I'm just me, not really. I'm no Stu Peters. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm on you. Thank God. <laughs> Thank God. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know. Anyway, right. That's fine. Won't go into that one. Um. So, <laughs> don't get me started. Um. So. Uh, yeah, anyway, so all oh, Maria Z. Uh, anyway, so, um, but I appreciate your time and I know you are a very, very, very busy woman. And uh, I hope the mere fact that you've come on here and, and uh, been able to give some advice to some people, and I assure you it's a great message of hope. And I hope that some people watch this video and they will, and um, and they'll get something from me from this. And I wish you all the best. And I certainly Thank wish you. your son, what was his name again? <laughs> Thanks. Nice. James Francis. James, James <laughs> Francis. Yeah, you might be waiting when before you okay. so <laughs> gotta hit his no, straps. You know I'm all oh, right, come on, stop it. You know I'm a bit of a sports freak. Yeah, so I do know that. Just a couple of quick questions. Is he is he a bowler or a batsman? He's both. He's both. He's an all rounder. Yeah, he, I think Ooh. he bats at four and um Well that's pretty good. He, for yeah, an all Apparently he. I have no clue. I hate cricket, <laughs> but oh, apparently he turns the ball and he bowls whatever that means. Oh, he's a spinner. Okay, he's a spin bowler. We don't know whether he's a. a well, no, he's, he's not. He's, not he's, he's actually got a bit of pace. He's not quite a spinner, but I don't know. Okay. Just, yeah, well, yeah, I don't get it. I, just, yeah, I can't numb. even tell the difference yeah, between numb. onside and offside. <laughs> So, okay, he's a swing bowler, let's say, and he's probably a medium pace swing bowler, and he bats. Yeah, something like that. That's a pretty handy position to fill for Australia, particularly for Australia. But anyway, who knows? <laughs> he, well, well he's got to start somewhere, and who, what's next? If he gets a, a bit of a gig with the Melbourne Cricket Club, he might be playing grade cricket pretty soon. You never know. We'll see. Yeah, that's his Hopefully. first step. That's his yeah, first step, Mum. I'm telling you now, as a cricket fan, that's his first step. Great. That's cricket. right. You got a dream. Right. Part of the dream <laughs> for a while. You're telling, you're telling the big O's going to watch him. <laughs> <Thanks for him. laughs> Lovely time. Peace and light. The old guy, Australia. Thank you, uh, Maria. Maria or Maria? Marie. Marie. Oh, Maria. <laughs> you're very welcome. <laughs> that's all right. You can't offend this girl, by the way. You just can't. Not correct. <laughs> thanks for your time. Peace and light. And signing out. And thanks very much. I'll be in touch with you very shortly, okay? See you, darling. Bye. Yeah, bye. Bye.